Well, here we are on a Sunday. Got here we you. are. That's right. It's time. <laughs> you got your coffee just in time. Sunday, uh, <laughs> Sunday, Sunday. So I woke, up, I woke up this morning. It was snowing. Oh. A lot. A oh, lot boy. of snow. Yeah. So yeah. welcome to Wood Midwest. <laughs> well, it's December. It's supposed to, right? So tell us, you know, that song really kicks when we were talking about it a little bit before we jumped on. Uh, can you give some background on that for anybody? Oh, yeah, me? yeah. I had a guy ask me on the last live stream, and that is a song that I co-produced, arranged, played drums on, along with my good friend, Michael Gam, great guitar player. And uh, um, he was my musical mentor at a period of time, like when I was about 2019, 20, 2021. 20, mm -hmm. He was just, he's a few years older. So... And he dug a little deeper into some of the, you know, musical paths that I didn't know about. And I used to go over late night on a Friday night or whatever and hang out with him. And we'd sit and he'd take like different albums and he goes, what do you mean you never heard Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers? <laughs> and then he would make me like a little compilation audio tape. I'd bring over a bunch of cassette tapes. Or what do you mean you never heard... Um, John Coltrane with Alvin Jones, you know, I'm like you're crazy know, cat, you know, just like all this stuff. So yeah, he made these great tapes. Anyway, we've kept in touch. I, I still speak with him. We don't do anything musically right now. In fact, I'm just don't have a chance to do any musical uh, settings right now for me. But uh, we did that in 1998, I believe. And my brother Ed was on okay. bass. All right. Um, Mark Shulman engineered and I'll give Mark also. He kind of co-produced too. We were all, producing but mike had great tunes there's four or five other tunes that we did in that session i should probably upload those or something or send you the tunes so you can check them out they're more they're vocal oriented tunes oh, okay cool. all right pretty cool well, they were kind of toozy you know yeah, it's a jamming tune it got me all excited so <laughs> let's get some background he, on that he brought, he brought that up because i guess he wrote something 
Then he said, remember Ninth Wave? I go, yeah. <laughs> I said, I've been using it on my live stream. He's like, oh, thanks. <laughs> he said, I got a tune that's kind of like that vibe, you know, that he's gotten written up there. Oh, we'd say hey, hi here to Bihar. Uh, Vihar, how are you, man? Nice and, to see uh, you. I see some people are, are jumping in already, which is really nice. What I'm going to set you free and let you run wild here. But today we got something uh, regarding a little our famous book we all know probably by now. But it's drama, I right? hope so. It's it's like <laughs> one of the bigger books in my world that I, I used and I've grabbed a lot of concepts from. And I just want to share some highlights and th how I've used it and and taking away the bullet points of what I brought into my playing and my teaching. So if you don't know the book, this is the book, Gary Chafee. He wrote four books in the original day. They were just called patterns. And then it was like volume one, volume two, volume three, volume four. There was sticking patterns, technique patterns, time functioning patterns. And, uh, oh man, what's the other one? The, 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 the sticking pattern. Rhythm and meter patterns. I went through rhythm and meter and sticking patterns at uh, the behest of Freddie Gruber. So when Vinnie Kaliuta was all the rage, I guess people were going like, oh, we studied with this great drum teacher back in Boston. And so somewhere around, let's see, if I started with Freddie, like it was the end of 77 or so, um, it wasn't too long after that, maybe around 79, those books were part of our uh, studies. And so just a couple of thoughts. I'll, I'll just go through a couple of my favorite sections and just kind of bring forward what I like to do with these. For the very beginning, he's just taking combinations of all single strokes and putting in single, double, triple, and quadruple accents. Well, okay. So how do you use that? Well, there's a whole you know setup that Gary does, which is pretty cool. I'll go to the double accents, just kind of jump around so we don't we don't get I can't get into every nuance of the minutia. But at this section, he's got like little groupings. So he's got two over three, two over five, two accents in seven note grouping. Then below on this this uh, line here, two to two, two to six, and two over eight. So you know two to four would would that be in two to six? So in other words, what is that? It means that there's two accents. Let's do the two and two, which would be da da dee dee da da dee dee down down up up down down up up down down up up down down up up. At first, uh, the follow-up exercises would be built upon taking those and putting those two accents in even spaces. So, for example, I'll just play through exercise one, and I'm going to do it. I'll, I'll count it out just so you can hang. If you don't have the book. You can get it later on and look at our stream as it will be archived up here on YouTube. And then have one and two and three and four and 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 one. And four and one two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one two and three and four and see I played a paradiddle there. Now, normally what I would do is I would say on the last bar, play a parrot. It'll go back to the beginning of that exercise one and play it left hand lead. Always good to serve up both leads, even though, you know, a lot of times it takes a little more time to break through the left hand and get it to sit and feel confident and comfortable. With all the practice I've done, I would still say that, you know, my right head or my right side is sort of like where my head sits most. Although, you know, my left hand's gotten more engaged in a lot of things as I've gone through the process. And so those are great. Now, one of the ver first exercises I would do is before I'd even get to that one, I would set up a few of these. So let me go to that double accented one and say, well, OK, we have uh, this two and two. So if I play it, it's down, down, up, up, down, down, up, up, down, down. Very crucial for the choreography, because if you don't have the movement, you're sort of like, you know, fielding the stick in an awkward fashion, you're not gonna really get the essence of the flow. So the choreography and the movement is always top priority to manifest good solid skills that become second nature. And I call that the inner logic of movement. Mm -hmm. And it's built again upon 
you know, tracing through a bunch of different things, not just necessarily single stroke issues, but paradiddles, double paradiddles, paradiddle diddles, um, and any combinations. In fact, I'll talk about a few combinations that Gary Chafee puts forward in the C section, the third section of the book. So with that double accent, like here's one way I would do that. I'm going to play. Uh, I'll just say, let's agree that there are 16th notes, two accents. And I'm going to th move through all the permutations. So I would play this, and I'll do it in two bar phrases. I'll play one, two, three, E, and, and four, E, and, oh, one, E, and, and two, E, and, and three, E, and, and four, E, and, oh, one, two, three, four, E, and, oh, one, E, and. Well, let's stop there. Because I changed up the move, in order for me to slide the accents up that one beat, I've got to take into consideration a new movement because I can't play down, down, up, up, down, down, up, up. So I have to insert a tap stroke before I resume. That would be down, down, tap, up, up. And then that moves my accents up that 1 16th note uh, slice. So once again, I'll do the second bar of the first one. One, two, down, down, up, up, down, down, tap, up, up, E and a uh, two, E and a uh, three, E and a uh, four, E and a uh, one, two, a uh, three, E and a uh, four, E and tap, up, up, down, down. Now I'm sliding that accent up to the end and the uh. So let me play it through. I'll do all four with the right side and then I'll play the left side as well. Let me speak just about the last one, because when I do this specific exercise, because I'm sliding that um, uh, 16th note accent up one uh, permutation, one, one 16th, um, that always creates that there'll be three unaccented notes between this accent group and the next one and the next accent group to the one that follows that. So when I get to the final one, that's going to be one E and a two E and a three E and a four which I always say is the most common. I think that most kids, there's a street sensibility about that going. Doo, 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 boom, boom, boom. So I put that one last. And that one actually starts on the uh of one to two, because we're going to keep that theme of three unaccented notes to get to the new uh, movement of accents. So let me play it so you can kind of see it clear. So it'll work like this. One. Two, nice and slow, and four. One E and mm, two E and mm, three E and mm, four E and a oh, one. Two, three E and a uh, four E and a oh, one E and mm, two E and mm, three E and a uh, four E and a oh, one. A uh, two, a uh, three E and a uh, four E and a oh, one E and a uh, and a uh, and a uh, one two. Three E and a uh, four E and a uh, one E and a uh, two, a uh, three, a uh, four, a uh, one E and a uh, two E and a uh, three E and a uh, paradiddle one E, two E, three E, four, one E, two E, three E and a uh, four E and a uh, one E and two E and two E and a uh, one and two. And three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one two three four and a one a two a three a four a one a two a three a paradiddle one E. Now there's a specific move on the paradiddle that takes a little time, but in general. If you take the basic movement of a single paradiddle, down, up, double, down, up, double, down, up, double. So when I play that on beat four, four, E, and, uh, well, that sets up my left hand to come down nicely for that accent when I switch to the left hand. But I've also got to put into motion the right hand so that it'll come down on the E of my left hand versions of these four accent groupings. So that diddle is an upstroke. So let me just do the last bar of this one, uh, two, uh, three, uh, four, E, uh, up, down, down. So my diddle's up, so that can set up the downstroke on E. So I hope you follow me. I do this in terms of how I write this out. I have notation, but um, 
I think you can pick up the, the, the greater good of what I'm trying to promote here. And what's the idea behind it? Just get good movements. So you feel like, okay, I can move. Of course, if you expand to the toms, that up, up, and down, down is not going to change. Your center is moving from here now to the toms or to the symbols. And that would be the case for a lot of things I do, is always moving things around and trying to get, hey, Ray, how are you? Happy Sunday to you, too. Sandy, hi. Larry Graves, how are you, Larry? Thank you, Jeffrey, for putting those up there. Good to see a bunch of people. So anyway, that accent structure, just to go to another uh, place with it, would also be good to work on, for example, triplets. Now you've got this kind of a, uh, um, putting four over the three. So what do I mean? If I'm playing it in triplets, I'll play it first. Let's just listen to it. And then I'll superimpose my count over it so that we can hear what's going on. So. One and lead two and lead three and lead four and lead one and lead two and lead three and lead four and lead one and lead two and lead three and lead four and lead one. Four over the three. So for me, that was a big one. I had heard that from Tony Williams, so I had that sound in my head. But things like this just help me to get acquainted with different ways of orchestrating these things for the bigger picture of developing phrasing and sentence structure. I can't say that I'm just going to sit with just a couple of these ideas. I want to go through them in long form, investigate how things move, how they sound, and then kind of draw into how do I get that into the tool belt of sentence structure? That's the bigger picture and that freedom. So, you know, what Freddie Gruber would always say to me, and this was for stick control, he say, it's not stickings, man. It's stick control. And so the idea of control. Well, in Gary's, he says it's stickings. But there is, I think, the underlying theme would be control. Developing control to hear a larger range of what you can do inside the stickings that you'll approach, the accent structures that you may encounter, and kind of pursuing that. So let me take a double accent thing that we already applied or that I just applied to that 16th note version because I'm going to take my idea of doing it with triplets, which I just did, and take a five note sticking with two accents. That would be that one transition sticking to move the accents up. But I'm just going to stay with that steady. It would be down, down, tap, up, up, down, down, tap, up. Whoops, uh, let, me, let me play it because I got I to... Gotta, and get my head into the narrative. So, so I'm going right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. And continuing that theme of five note groupings with two accents, but I want to superimpose them over different rhythmic gears that would help me. What is that? Ah, two common ones, triplets and sixteenths, right? You got to think, what is your tempo when you're working on phrasing? If your tempo is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay, well, you, you could play definitely at that tempo. Eighth notes, two, a one, two, three, four, but. Okay. I just went into triplets. So I have triplets accessible at that tempo. And at that tempo, I could certainly get into. Sixteenth notes. So knowing that that that's going to be part of what I could do sentence structure wise, I want to work on different approaches to assemble a flow from those different rhythmic groupings and throw in some accents, throw in some melodies so that I'm not just stuck in kind of one mode and work from there. So again, what I'm trying to point out is that tempo can always dictate what you have access to rhythmically, and you got to be beholden to that. And if you're uncomfortable with different stickings at a certain tempo, this is a book that you can work on. It also, not only just throwing us into our more mainstream rhythms of triplets and 16th notes, or if you were playing a little faster, you know, uh, 16th notes and 16th triplets, or if you're playing, you know, whatever the, the relationship is, you're also going to encounter quintuplets and subtuplets. 
Certainly not necessarily the norm, but it does give you ownership or greater ownership of your quarter note pulse. And so I encourage everybody to go through those, but it's very rare that I'm going to be going boom, bap, doom, bap, doom, dig it, 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 that, dig it, dig that, and playing quintuplets. It sounds like a, uh, a four wheel a four wheel cart turned into a three wheel cart, but because it's five, so maybe it was a six wheel cart. We knocked the wheel off. Whatever the case may be, it doesn't flow as we would want in a rock and roll setting. So you know, if you're playing in more um, expressive situations or uh, mathematical situations that would uh, allow for that, absolutely got to get into that, man. I spent time working on it. I have a fair amount of uh, adeptness at it. It's not my full range of expertise. For expertise, you go to Virgil Donati. That's a guy who's got that down whew, way past and well beyond. So anyway, here's the five note sticking. I would do it two ways. And some of my building blocks, or all of my building blocks, I should say, would always be built in four bar phrases. What is music made up? We're built in phrases, two bars, four bars, eight bars, 12 bars for the blues, 32 bars for just regular AABA song form. Yes, there are songs that would encounter maybe a seven and a half bar form or a three and a half bar where it comes up to add the tension, to extend the verse or extend the chorus or whatever you're doing for the emotional value of that. But in general terms. We want to get really just rooted where you just know that's a four bar phrase. No thinking about it. No hesitating. So let me take that single stroke, five note sticking, superimpose it over eighth note triplets. Uh, I'll just kind of hang there. I won't worry about doing any left hand leads and let's just mark it out. So what do I always say to my students? Tap your foot. One, two, count out loud. Hear everything. Don't let the movement of the accent, or if we have another sticking, in this case, it's going to be alternating. Don't let that uh, remove your foot or let your foot slip and slide. There's a tendency once in a while to readjust because those accents aren't coming around the way you're conditioned. So here we go. A one, two, a one and lead two and lead three and lead four and lead one and lead two and lead three and lead four and lead one and lead two and lead three and lead four and lead one and lead two and lead three and lead four and lead one and lead two and lead three and lead four and lead one. So on the very last one, beat four of the fourth bar, I just played a left, right, left. If I was doing it to switch over to the left hand lead, I would just make it a left, right, right. So just adjusting. So I have a transition sticking so I can go back and do another four bar phrase of the left hand lead. Uh, the 16th note version, let's slow it back a little bit so things aren't moving beyond your comprehension and your tracking ability. You want to stay synchronized and knowing every 16th note, every nuance of your sticking and your movement. So again, the tracking mechanism is really being developed in such a way that when you do play it faster, you're going to be able to keep up with yourself. You're not going to be able to throw yourself off the horse and lose yourself and go, ah, and crash and burn. So here we go, nice and slow with the 16th note version. And one E and two E and three E and a four E and a one, two E and three E and four E and a one. Uh, two e and three e and four e and one e and two e a uh, three e and a uh, paradiddle one e and two e and three e and a uh, etc. So there was like I went into the left hand lead by putting that paradiddle in there. You can mix it up and put those to the toms. Absolutely a necessity. So you can explore those golden moments of like exploring are where things will start to step forward to you and you might find something that at first felt a little peculiar and all of a sudden it starts to become a little more mainstream in your head so nothing comes from doing nothing you spend some time in investigating and you will absolutely start to develop a larger range a larger range in what you can put together so for that single stroke idea again Going to the continuing theme, Gary's got four note, he's got three note, and then he superimposes them over eighth notes, triplets, sixteenths, quins, sextuplets, septuplets, and 32nd notes. 
a lot of stuff to go through. Um, for me, I went through this pretty diligently and tried to get, you know, like, so if I was just playing, let's see if I could just get into a little scheme of here. If I'm playing triplets, now I'm going to probably throw in some doubles because it's just my nature to get through the phrasing. But if I was just hanging and going like, So I'm just mixing it up. I was throwing some 16th in, uh, 16ths in there as well. And so I was sitting around here. A one, two, three, four, one, and two, and two. So and on and on and on with that. And you could sit around and play it on the drums. Uh, part of my practice would utilize what I call getting in the sandbox and throwing sand around. Would you ever play accents on the upstroke? Absolutely. Let me get to that in one second. But what I would do is get around the kit and start to play. Play slow enough where you can follow your lines of thought. Really start to experiment. If you fall off, stop. Take a breath. Start again. Mm -hmm. So it it's it it serves up no good. Um, what do you want to say? Good practice headspace to fall off your chair and then try to desperately get back on there, because this is just practicing reckless. You got to stop, reboot, and start again. So again, that may be like uncomfortable because where our heads already clicking and clicking and clicking and clicking. And you might have to just go whoop and pull yourself back. Like, all right, wait a minute, start again. What was it you were trying to play in my practice years ago? I would do that. And if I fell off, I would sometimes go, well, wait a minute. I had a vague outline of what I was going for. Let me crystallize that. So I would sit methodically and figure out where I was going, where I was in the bar, <laughs> what I had left in me sticking wise to resolve that phrase. And I would just hang and work it out. There's a repetitiveness that we practice on every front. So, all right. So as to the upstroke accents, in a single setting, singles, probably not. But where there's a double, absolutely with the upstrokes. Now, let me demonstrate. So here's my most common um, demonstration that I always do. It would be upstrokes. Uh, with double paradiddles and triplets because it sits very nicely with the down, up, down, up, one and lead, two and lead, three and lead, four and lead. So I can get that upstroke. One of the things you want to work on manifesting is a range of control where you're not anticipating and adding a large stroke in anticipation of your upstroke, but you're able to hang low and be of, uh, have a, a constitution, so to speak, of staying with it and waiting for the upstroke and not getting anxious and going, ah, I got to lift up. You got to temper your reflexes. And so some of these exercises, well, everything that I do is all about that is to really bring about a relaxed state, not adding any uh, lift and drop where it's not necessary. And that creates more efficiency to what you're doing with your stickings. So going on beyond that, you know, I'll use just um, uh, a couple of phrases here. I'll do three phrases. I'll play upstrokes with single paradiddles. Two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and and one. And when I always do this with my students, I'll speak out the length of my and because at this tempo, that also demonstrates or uh, reflects upon the value of a dotted quarter note to have that lift and drop. Now, of course, we have our one. Note, uh, in fact, I found this peculiar when I was a kid, but because you got to think when we play a whole note, one, two, three, four, one, we have no way to sustain. We have interpretive ways of su sustaining notes, but we don't have any way to really sustain notes like a horn player or a pianist or a guitarist. So that being said, the value of movement that we can create can give us the actual element of length of note. 
And so that up to down is crucial. So anyway, when I'm thinking about those ups and downs, I really want to have a nice fluid follow through where I don't get stuck in the mud and just here and then lift up erratically or lift up too quickly. And all those, uh, what do you want to say, have, have to be uh, taken into consideration. Uh, Bruce, one issue I have, as you know, is trying to play fast before I own the motion. Can you touch upon the value of slow, deliberate practice? Yes. So the slow, exactly what I'm just saying, slow and deliberate allows you to sit back and track and follow every, every single note you play, every move you put behind that note. When you can do that slowly and start to increase the value of flow at a slower tempo, that's practicing what I call the art of the flow, getting that essence of that movement in there. It will shift and change. Anatomy will change. In other words, if I play super slow, I've got way more space to take hold of. If I'm playing it faster, I can't lift that high. That would be out of character with the tempo that I'm playing or the velocity of movement that I have. So I got to be super mindful of that. And we all want to just tick off to the races in our heads. It's common for anybody to do something and take it and then just run away with it. And usually what happens is you derail yourself. So to have the patience and the ability to really sit focused and do that slowly is a key component. Well, you know, in our modern times of this distraction and the computer distraction and all that stuff that we've been inundated with, Maybe it's not as easy to sit and focus. Maybe it wasn't before. But either way, you've got to just take it upon yourself. And like I said, nothing comes from doing nothing. Sit down. Get yourself sucked into one exercise so that you can really sit there and hang. And I'll go back to what I said before, too. Sorry to be redundant, but that's part of practice is being redundant. When you derail, don't try to get back on the, on the horse when you're still kind of fumbling and falling off, stop. Silence. <laughs> As I said from the, the good old Wizard of Oz, silence, whippersnappers. I say that to my kids when they're getting too loud. And so bring your head to zero. Start again. Erase all the chalk on the chalkboard because it's like mm, floating around your head. Stop. Reboot. Sit slowly, work it out, stay methodical. I know that that's not the easy fix. You know, everybody's going instant hack, man, instant hack. Oh, here's my instant hack. It's not how it goes, man. Um, Mac Voody. Okay, cool name. I've been playing that go-to pattern ever since I saw you do it on Drumio Bruce. Question, do you ever move the accents to the other notes in that pattern? Um. I don't know exactly what pattern. If it's a five note pattern, you can, you can rearrange it, whatever, because you cover all the different permutations, but yeah, everything is always good to investigate. If, um, if I'm looking to do something and I can't like see it clear on the chalkboard up here, I write it out. I sit down, I write it out and I go, Oh, that's how it looks. So, you know, I want to have that imprint. And that's another part of practice is to develop, your inner chalk, chalkboard in your head and your visual chalkboard. There's nothing wrong with putting notes. In fact, when you know when you played in a big band, like the thing was have a pencil, write things in. If there's something that that when you get to it, you go like, oh no, I'm gonna crash. You put those, you used to draw the pair of glasses, like look here, remember this. And that visual stimulation rests in my head uh, forever. You know, like once I do something and I've seen it, it rests very uh, firmly imprinted. Um, unfortunately, it's easier to hide the sloppiness. At, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. When you're playing slow and fluid, there's no getting away from the, any bumps and grinds and um, uh, inconsistencies to your motion. You know, if you're not doing this and you're going, uh, uh, I see all sorts of things. So that's what I do every day pointing out those little movements, making sure that you're not adding your shoulder, make sure that you're having access to the hinge in your forearm, or I mean, in your elbow, so your forearm, when it lifts, it's a fluid motion, not over-releasing the stick. All those components of choreography, I've been talking about those for a hundred years, facetiously, but you know, a good portion of my teaching career. So 
Um, going back to the upstroke action, I just want to finish my thought there. So here's, I'll, I'll pick it up just a little bit and I'll play, I'll play four bars of um, eighth note paradiddles. I'll play eight bars of double paradiddle and eighth notes. So that's going to play over the bar line and I'll play the down and the upstroke accent. And then I'll play uh, the very final thing will be a triple paradiddle that will have a bounce close up and one and two and three and one and two and three. And so here we go. One, two, a one, two, three, four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and one, two, and now to the second one, and one, and two, and three, and four, 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 and one, and two, and up and down down up etc i have different labelings for what i'm doing mechanically those are crucial to get the recognition of what's going on so along with your your motion the directives are important because they reinforce what you're doing movement wise and if you're not in tow with those and really tapping in, then again, you might be doing something that works against the development of flow. So I've designed many of my movements would be along the lines of what other people would speak about. Up, tap, down. I'm not going to change that. But to qualify how the stick bounces and some of the things that I put forward that are rather important mechanically I have different directives that are important. Those are to be spoken out as well so that you get a relationship with that move. You also have to have a relationship with where you are in the bar so that you're not just doing patterns and sort of going, well, if I do five of these, I'll get out in so many bars. Well, yeah, you want to know that. But you also want to be able to identify like where you are inside the bar, knowing that you're hitting the accent on the N of three or hitting the accent on the E of four. Wherever those accents fly, you want to make sure that you're able to track and follow. At some point, you lose the count. It becomes a sentence structure, and you're not thinking about all your spelling of your words or your commas and stuff like that. You're just speaking sentence structure. But you want it to be uh, coming out without tripping and falling. So anyway, so that being said, hey, Ron, hey, Ron, no questions. Yet, but enjoy the material and give a big amen to the slow and deliberate practice. Thank you. Learning the value of going slow is a critical lesson. Thank you. And Ron's been with me for, well, for certainly over a year and made tons of progress in his practice following my lead in terms of that slow, deliberate practice. Again, it's, it's so counterintuitive. Everybody wants to pick up the sticks and kind of fly and go. And then we see all these videos on YouTube or Instagram or whatever's out there, TikTok, Twitch. I don't know. I'm making stuff up now. Well, Twitch I've heard about. I don't know what it is. But you see that and you go like, wow, that's so cool. But how does that affect you? That's what Freddie Gruber would say. He goes, you go to a clinic and you see a guy do a great presentation and it, and it, and it creates enthusiasm. And you want to be able to do that. But in some cases, there's a couple steps. One, how do I get there? Two, how does that affect me for my musical, you know, colors and palettes? Am I, am I going to use something like that? Well, conceptually, you can always take something away from somebody and build it into your own scheme. That would be the, the uh, Clark Terry of the um, uh, imitate, uh, assimilate, and innovate. Take things in and process them. So, but the point is, is when you do it slow and you reframe what's going on and you can see every nuance, you're developing this tracking mechanism up here. Crucial. I would say that if we talk to, I don't know, bring up a bunch of drummers and speak to them, everything that they're doing in probably almost every context has been given some pretty good scrutinization and thought. I can't imagine that guys are flying by the seat of their pants. Now there are, there are guys who really go into this. I want to go in with zero head and I'm just going to kind of play and feel. They still have things that they've worked out in advance to execute. Right. So maybe on a, on a, on a great day, you have a, a, a moment of inspiration where you rearrange some thoughts and things come forward and you go, Oh my God, that was incredible. So 
Anyway, let's go back to Gary Chafee because I'll do another sticking that I think is really effective. And um, that sticking would be a five note sticking, but now take into consideration the double. So if you go to Gary's book, oh, I think it starts on 35, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah. So it's part three, compound stickings. His definition of compound stickings are combinations of singles and doubles. He has five letters, a group A, a group B, a group C, a group D, and a group E. Group E, he stays with the same sticking over the same rhythmic value. For the previous A, B, C, D, he kind of knocks it around and puts it forward to um, have some different rhythms to go over. And it's really clever because the definition of each letter is expansive. So the first one, group A stickings, are one single note. So a single note followed by some number of doubles. Well, that gives you several different combinations. You could play threes. You could play fives. You could play sevens. Now, they're not meant to be literal and say like, okay, I'm only uh, relegated to playing a three, so I can only play triplets or I can only play quintuplets. No, 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 no. You've got to superimpose those over different rhythmic values. So, for example, if I just took threes for a moment, that could be one E and a two E and three E and four E, right? And continuing on and just keep playing groups of threes over 16th notes. You could play... Uh, the five note grouping, and let's just do that in 16th notes one e and a two e and a three e and four e and a one e and two e and three e and four e and and keep going with that. I'll again, I'll use those and build them up into four bar phrases. Or you could get nuts and start to do like threes with quintuplets, which he does at one point. I think it's uh, study number, is it number 15? I always forget. Let's see, number. Here's number 14, sorry, 15 is the septuplet. So, you know, he might have one, two, three, four, five, 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 and put those groups of threes over quintuplets. Not easy. You got to really kind of think through what's going on so that your ability to hear that is being developed. Now, am I going to use that? No, but I went through it because, again, it gave me better ownership of quarter note pulse, and I was fascinated with those kind of rhythmic groups just as a, a guy on the sidelines going, all right, can I do that? And it worked uh, very valuable for me in some recording sessions that I had to do some odd time stuff, odd time phrasing. I worked with a couple of composers that wrote really silly, odd time stuff. And I think if it wasn't for this, coupled with uh, Ralph Humphrey's book, I don't think I would have been there, you know? And then my own thinking because I did get a chance with my brother. He wrote some odd time material from time to time. And that helped out as well. So with the uh, five note sticking, let's go to a different place with it. We'll go to his group C stickings, which is uh, the definition would be three single notes followed by some number of doubles. So his uh, representation for that could be um, let's see, let's just look here. So I can just, I know it's a five, I know it's a seven, but does he go any deeper than that? No, he really just goes with the two examples of five note, which would be uh, seven note, which would be, again, three sim singles followed by some number of doubles. Well, there'll be two groups of doubles. So it'll be And then he does it with uh, the two accents and all three. So, and he's got movements written in there. Um, they may not stimulate your head in terms of what's going on movement wise. He's got an FT, FTT for the five note. That means full stroke, tap stroke, full stroke, tap, tap. I may rearrange that because it may feel better for me to do a down up in that five note grouping. So right, left, right, left, left could be. That might be a very effective, efficient way. And again, it always boils down to context. So, but, so for the group C stickings, I'm just gonna take a very simple approach. I'm gonna do my four bar phrases. I'll do my little math equation 
that I always do with everybody. And it gets them like kind of nervous. It's like, oh no, math. All right. So in a four bar phrase, if I take that five note sticking in a four bar phrase of eighth note triplets, how many triplets would I have? Four times 12, 48. Five is not divisible by 48, but uh, 45 is. So that means you have three left over. That would be beat four of that fourth bar. In a five note sticking, it's going to take five bars to reboot. So we could go the five bar route. I just think, again, it's better to reinforce like these four bars, uh, four bar phrases. So that being said, when I hit that four end lead of the fourth bar, that would really be the beginning of the new five beat phrase. Right, left, right would be followed by left, left if I continued that idea of five note phrasings. But I'm just going to use it because it works nice and easy to right, left, right to throw me to my left hand. So let me play. Oh, one, two, three, and lee, four, and lee, one, and lee, two, and lee, three. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> one, two, three, and lee, four, and lee, one, and lee, two, and lee, three, and lee, four, and lee, one, and lee, two, and lee, three, and lee, four, and lee, one, and lee, two, and lee, three, and lee, four, and lee, one, two, three, four, and lee, one, and lee, two, and lee, three, and lee, four, and lee, one. Two and Lee three and Lee four and Lee one and Lee two and Lee three and Lee four and Lee one and Lee two and Lee three and Lee four and Lee back to the right hand lead. Put them on the toms, create a bunch of different melodies. Um, I'll play a couple of melodic ideas here. I got to turn my mic down because I don't have my system set up where it's going to be conducive. So I'm going to just drop my mic down. Let's see if this goes. And let's put on that overhead cam. Bear with me, please. Uh, cameras. Uh, let's go overhead. I think that's the overhead. Winner. There we go. So here we go. Here's a couple of ideas melodically. Okay, am I back, Jeffrey? Is that good? Just making sure. Did I? You're, go you're, you're golden. You sounded okay. great. Great. So, all right. So, you know, I just don't have that system set up yet. We're working on that. Sorry for being slow and not technologically savvy like many others. But so I did that, that move with the melody. I want to get so inside that melody so that I can use it. My quest for something like that, just as a, you know, as a looking back into how that affected me was to break free specifically with triplets and not get stuck into one sticking. So my go-to sticking, which I think many people would agree with me, and it's a great one, is a six-stroke roll. You know, and then uh, the cousin, the parrot did a little. But I also wanted to have good so uh, solid single, so I could do the one side molar, accents, And a variety of things. I know I'm just kind of trying to run through my head quickly. Um, double paradiddles. Double paradiddles with two accents. The double paradiddle with the upstroke accents. Uh, doubles. And so I would exhaust my head going through those and try to play some triplet flows. The quintuplet was nice because the accent structure moves to all the different parcels. So you can get some downstroke, middle beats, upbeats of the triplets nice and easy by just running that through. So if I play the triplets a little faster, 
A one, two, three, four. And just kind of stopping there to say, I'd want to go other places. And creating those off ramps so that you can get that little golden bar and a half or two bars of what you want to do and connect it with something else. That's sort of the, the thought process. And I got to say that the Gary Chafee Sticking Patterns book was a huge lane in developing that. Going through these was really helpful. And then uh, going through and bringing about the highlights that affected me. So that being said, let me go to the 16th note version of that five note sticking because that works real well as well. You got 16 notes to a bar, right? And we've got four bars. So we have 64 16th notes. Five is not divisible by 64, but it is divisible by 60. And then you have four left over. Well, there's your beat four of your fourth bar. In this case, though, if I was staying with the idea of that five note sticking, it would be right, left, right, left, and there would be a left on beat one of the fifth bar. Don't want to do that. I'm going to use my trusty old paradiddle. So that'll be my transition sticking on the fourth beat of the fourth bar. So I would play two, three, and four, and one, e, and two, e, and a, three, e, and four, e, and a, one, e, and two, e, and three, e, and a, four, e, and one, a, two, e, a, three, e, and four, e, and a, one, e, and two, a, three, e, and paradiddle, one, e, and two, e, a, three, and four, e, and two, e, and three, e, and a, four, e, and one, one can't emphasize enough the importance and the value of counting. That's not easy. And, you know, you run out of breath, but you got to learn to breathe and you got to learn how to feel that uh, understanding of where you are inside the bar and not lose sight of that. It's very easy to kind of get derailed. So, you know, that's why you practice it slow. The idea of counting slowly will reinforce what you're doing with your sticking. So there's a couple things to take it, you know, into consideration. I got to know the sticking. I can't let that sticking be derailed by some reflex. I've got to count. I can't not count. That's a double negative. Uh, I got to keep my foot in the game too, so that I can feel that underlying quarter note pulse as well. Super important. And so how are you going to ma manage all those? Slow. Breathe and play them slow. Don't be too quick to try to solve an issue or a puzzle within 10 minutes. Give yourself the processing time. Like I said, the redundancy of what we do is everything in terms of practice. You know, I've been playing, let's see, 2022 will put me into, I think it's July, somewhere mid-July, uh, 50 years of drumming. All right. And I learned a paradiddle fairly quickly after that studies back then and i'm still practicing that paradiddle it's like i haven't lost it it's still uh, a part of my daily diet so that being said you don't just get something together in five minutes there's a redundancy and fortunately for me i've been pretty consistent with sticks in my hand for those many years to build upon the continued expansion of what i want to do in terms of sticking now in most cases now i'm pretty comfortable there's other things I'd like to kind of insert, and those are conceptually being chipped away at. You know, they may not show up on the gig or, well, there's no gigs for me, but they may not show up always like instantaneously in my playing. But there was a lot of things to consider, not just these specific sticking values, because if I was going to put together like a whole program and say, like, here are some really great um, concepts to build your phrasing. Well, there's different paths I would take to do that. And so each path yields certain results that, again, would be indicative of that larger expansive phrasing that you're after. And again, it's a small uh, part of the lane of what we do because it's more about time. But I know everybody wants to have headroom and get around that kit easier. Thomas, what is the best way to build fulcrum? It might destroy my technique and uh, being free to music, it seems to affect my wrist motion. Blah, 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 that's frustrating thinking. Well, okay. Fulcrum. Fulcrum is pivot. There's a consistency in fulcrum. Now we're getting away from what I was topically talking about, but this again is one of those topics that is near and dear to my heart that I deal with. Every student I've dealt with is always 
a rebuilding of how they're facilitating the stick inside the hand. There are some specific areas that I want to drive into so that there's an easy continuity of from German to French or resting in between in the American position. And so there's certain pressure points, positionings, exercises that I do that are very specific to certain areas to develop that. So fulcrum, well, you know, your wrist could be a fulcrum. You want your wrist to be a participant. But if you're playing faster, your wrist is not going to be compliant to go. You're going to bust down. I already felt like a tinge in my kind of shoulder into my bicep area trying to do that in my forearm. That's not going to help. I got to meander into fingers at that point. So the wrist would be a component. And yes, some of the things I want with the wrist are to have a nice, loose, flowing list, not wrist, not allowing it to over-release, but be aware of the range in motion from the largest of turns back to the drop forward. And then when I release and come through that space to re-deliver my downstroke, where does that sit in context of how much release do I have? Um, positioning for German is consistent with French. Now there's a few little anatomical differences when I'm in French grip. I don't have my wrist accessible. That's not really my wrist. That's the radius ulna. So the whole mechanism, the forearm is being driven by the bouncing stick. Did you hear what I said? That's being driven from the bouncing stick. I'm not winding and grinding. Winding and grinding would create tension in a way that would be against the grain of bounce. Bounce is you being responsive to follow the bounce back, whether it's here. Now, I watched a video where somebody was doing a bounce exercise and they were talking about, oh, yeah, just bounce and let your fingers grab. I wouldn't do that. The fulcrum and the bounce factor, I want my fingers to stay static so that there's a, uh, a gentle placement around the stick to secure it, whereby I'm not tight. I'm not loose and fumbling around and out of sync by letting my fingers move. So uh, movement will add or subtract how much anatomy you need. So when you talk about fulcrum, that can be a, a moving target, so to speak. It's not just one, but in terms of grip, how you're housing the stick, well, there are different points inside the hand that can represent a little bit more of a pressure point to induce that more economical flow of how your hand can operate. If you're pinching here and you have too much tension here, that's closing down access to the back of the hand. And if you're closed down, that's certainly not gonna give you a full resonant body tone out of the stick. Now, positionings can augment the tone, but I want each position to represent the most full resonant quality of the stick that you can possibly muster up. That's how you get your set to sound good. It's not the drum set per se, it's you. So your delivery. And I say this quite often as well. You know, if it's not something interesting for you, no worries. Move along and go to somebody else. But for me, it's a big consideration. So there's a lot of detail that I put behind it. And I could look on my phone right now and text 75 guys right now and say, what would you speak about in terms of your tonal quality from where you were before you studied with me to where you are now? And I would say, we'll get a resounding 100% of everybody going, oh my God, I sound way better. My, my drum set sounds better. For those from the drumio community, are these exercises covered in your tip? Some of them a little bit, but not the detail of the inside of the hand. And I always joked and said, if I did a technique course like that, it would take 126 weeks. Sorry to be so daunting, but Technique is one of those things, and especially with drums, that you work on for your continued uh, career. It's not like you get to one spot and you just leave it behind. Now, there are guys who do. They're complacent. That's fine. I'm not. Uh, one of my former students who just turned 75, he wasn't complacent. He's still not complacent. He's a guy that continually practices and chips away and works on it. And one of the great drummers in our community, like one of the greatest contributors to the funk, and that's David Garibaldi. So, and I've had other guys like Mark Shulman, uh, Daniel Glass, um, Ralph Johnson from Earth, Wind & Fire, Tristan Bowden, all these guys. 
they're older guys. They wanted to create a better relationship of how they're moving with the stick. So, you know, it behooves you to stay inside how things work, chipping away, getting that flow. Um, even in my own playing, I would say, you know, like my chops feel better than they've ever felt before. And that's because I stay rooted to the things that I preach. I practice those pretty, you know, diligently. Okay. Yes, it is. I took the course and it changed my life. All right. Thank you, Deuce. Um, oh, you know, I think I remember having some interactions with you too. Didn't you, uh, weren't you in the second version of uh, DTME when I was still involved? Because now the course just goes on its own. You don't have access to me. And it's original runnings for the two times that it ran live. I was there to um, assist people. But a lot of the movement-based stuff I have together. But there's so many things to do to consume for a movement. And I've kind of chipped away and even moved deeper into certain aspects of things that I think are really, really valuable and super user-friendly to getting around the kit much easier and building upon that in um, what I say, not getting too um, knocked out with too much content, but really digging into the concept. So what does that mean? Well, you could do 48 or 50 or 60 exercises, but if you're not getting the concept that may not help those 50 or 60 exercises. And you may feel kind of like you're spinning around and not really sitting with it. Better to sit with four to six of things that will like really allow you to dig deep to the concept. And that's really what I want to pass on that conceptual approach so that you're giving it thought. You might come back to me, uh, you know, a few lessons later and go like, Hey man, I was thinking about this and I put it together this way and I'll go great. You know, that's again, that, that imitate, assimilate, innovate, take these exercises and also build a way that stimulates how your head works, you know? So I'm very conscientious. So of, of being mindful of how people work, how they play, what music they're consuming. And so that I can kind of bring forward the best of what we can do for their musical setting. I still would encourage everybody to expand your range, but you know, Everything takes time. So you can't just all of a sudden convert somebody from this one element of their playing and music and go like, no, you need to be over here. You, you know, you've never played Latin. You got to be a Latin guy. Well, you can't play Latin in one minute. But understanding Latin rhythms and the value of that from, you know, the Cuban dialect or the Brazilian dialect, super helpful, man. You know, it really brings about. Uh, a little more tangible understanding of the larger scheme of rhythms. But as I always say, coupled with good technique, and then you're on the right path. So those are a few kind of things that I would, you know, go through in the Gary Chafee book. There are many more. I really like, like, for example, in the back of the book, uh, what is it? Page 64, I think it is. So page 64, after you've gone through like your A group stickings, your B group, your C, your D, and your E, he basically puts together like these combinations. So I remember when I first saw the book, I go like, what? So for example, here's an easy one. He says, two measures of triplets, 24 notes. And his sticking is, let's do a cool one. Um... Well, I'll just do the very first one just because, you know, we're, we're, I'm looking at that. I haven't looked at these in a while. It says 5A, 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 4B. Well, first, you have to know what an A sticking definition is. Second, you have to think, okay, uh, 5, 5, 5, 5, and 4. That's 24 notes. That's 24. So the A sticking for the 5A would be 1 and lead 2 and lead 3 and lead 4 and lead 1 and lead 2 and lead 3 and lead 4 and lead there's a paradiddle now. It turns around to the left hand lead. Pretty cool. Put them on the toms, put them on the cymbals, split them between your hi hat and your snare drum. That's what Garibaldi would do. And just kind of hang and see what kind of ideas can be stepped, you know, kind of be brought forward in your head. Now, again, you're the architect, so you got to get in deep and hang with these and build deeper bridges. I can build pretty good bridges, but. I can't build every single bridge in the, uh, let's say the completeness that you can. So I give you the tools 
the hammers, the nails, the wood. I show you how to build a couple of houses and then you got to like really design that house for yourself. But these were just masterful for me, man. When I first looked through these, I went really like, wow, this is excellent. And uh, that is what, how many pages is he, does he do that? He does that for two pages of these combinations. So he's got uh, two measures of triplets, four measures of triplets, one measure of sixteenths, two measures of sixteenths, and then four measures of sixteenths. And uh, then he's got, you know, usage of the feet. Um, which is really imperative as well to, to create the relationship of top to bottom. I'm a stickler on first, get the quarternote pulse to be manifested in such a way that is deeply rooted in your playing because that can be the glue that can keep you together even when you're playing drum fills. A lot of guys experience this idea of I'm playing time, then I go to my fill and I'm like, whoa, what happened? Well, part of it is keep some element of the bottom in terms of the time stable underneath what you're doing. Um, for jazz playing, when I was younger, um, when I was a kid, of course, you went boom, chick, boom, chick, boom, chick, boom, chick. And as I got a little older in my early 20s, I was like, oh, man, I don't want to play four on the floor. That's square, man. Nobody does that. And then talking to Jimmy Chapin in the 90s, he'd say like, oh, a lot of those guys feathered four on the floor. You know, they were, they were doing that because you couldn't hear him because they were playing an 18-inch bass drum. Well, I have to take him for his word because he was out watching a lot of guys. So um, I started to utilize that feathering on the floor. And it's a huge component for that uh, with rock and roll playing. Again, I would probably ditch the bass drum and just play and maybe have the hi-hat going or something like that. And... Later, I started to feel like there was something missing. There was a frequency and a bottom to the time that was missing. So that was a big component of adding that. And you can be creative about it, you know. If you listen to Bonham when he's doing that, like the halftime shuffle, the Fool in the Rain, there's the, you know, the just the drum track of that. Listen to him when he does his drum fills. His bass drum stays uh, uh, consistent with what he was playing with the pattern. I'm not saying you have to do that all the time, but you can add a, Boom boom bap go 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 bap doom digga digga do go digga digga do go digga digga boom boom bap and be able to have that control where you can keep the quarter note so everything feels real good, etc. So Bruce on a related topic, I watched a Fred Astaire movie recently. And all I kept thinking was this guy has an incredible flow, like Bruce talks about for drumming. Oh, thank you, man. That's um that dance, man. Dance is so related to drumming. In fact, how many drummers? We're dancers. And and yes, this guy, D, or is that a lady? I'm sorry, maybe. I'm not sure. Uh, Fred Hestere also played drums. That's right. He was uh, like amazing. Like he could sit down and play. Sammy Davis Jr. could play the drums. And he was an amazing hoofer. So you've seen uh, Papa Joe dance. And uh, uh, Buddy Rich was a tap dancer. Louis Belson. I think there's a great correlation to that. Steve Gadd. Steve Gadd was a tap dancer. He was featured on the Mickey Mouse Club when he was a little kid. Uh, in his first video, he talks about that constant release motion, which that's what Freddie Gruber titled it. So I kind of stand by that, that titling of that uh, approach. But Steve Gadd says it's nothing more than a, a, a tap dance maneuver, you know, getting from the heel to the toe to the toe to the heel. Now, I wouldn't say the toe, but the ball of the foot, because that's what you want to dance. For the pedal, you want to feel that rolling motion over your pedal. So yeah, there's a there's a great correlation to dance and drumming, and I have those um, exercises that I've sort of readapted and reframed in the Buddy Rich book to deal with the upstrokes and downstrokes, get them to swing, and have a, comp uh, a masterful component of how that works into your playing. You're always going to have some kind of value of that down and up. You know, if you're just playing like this, well, there's still upstrokes in there, but that's just hammering. You can get everything to dance nicely and get everything to move and all the bounce value and the, the um, upstroke value and the space value to that and how that rhythmically is aligned with what you're doing can be really recognized and change the whole game. Absolutely change the whole game. Uh, great lesson. Where to start for someone relatively new looking to improve melody and flow around the kit through sticking patterns. So many books and lessons. It can be overwhelming. This book, DTME. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, a little bit of the Gary Chafee book. 
Um, if you want really to get that flow, you know, there is the technical component to really bring it to life so that your positioning when you get around the drum kit can be adapted to move with the different positions of what we would call just in terms of labeling German to French to American. And understanding that is key to getting the movement to really dance. Because if you're just hammering it out, but you're doing the move, it'll help. No, don't, don't, uh, you know, misunderstand me on that, but you can really build it up to a greater level of fluidity. You got to be super mindful of the component of rebound and how the stick works inside the hand. And there's also what I call this ability for me to give direction to the energy of the stick and the bounce. So in other words, if I hit a floor time, it doesn't really give a lot of rebound. So I have to give the direction and put a little bit of the energy behind that to give that flow and understand that direction of as if the stick was an independent uh, implement, you know, like the, or if there was like a little rubber ball on the stick tip, I want to be mindful of that. I don't want to work away from those um, concepts, whether it's physics concepts, I guess would, we would basically say, I can't move away from those. If I'm working against them, you're, you know, you're going to get in trouble. You got to work with them. And, you know, guys like Buddy Rich, I mean, a bunch of drummers, I think, have somewhat tapped into it. Uh, my game is just to be able to articulate it and put it into digestible bits of information to formulate the path to get there so that it's not a confusing thing. It may be a little daunting, but at the end of the day, as I always say, and Freddie would say this, sit down like you got no place to go in a million years to get there, Right. That's the headspace that you want to approach your practice at. Not easy to achieve or attain on a daily basis. But if you have this like super, let's say, diligent tenacity to push and keep working it, you'll make results. But Chafee's book would be a good start. If you're really serious about opening up those um, motions and how the hand can be redesigned, call me up. I mean, I fairly full, but there's always a little ebb and flow in the schedule. And uh, depending upon what time zone you're in, and I'd be more than happy to work with you. But just remember that I can't fix something in two seconds, but you can talk to, again, I can go 65 or 75 guys right now that are, are students of mine. And um, yeah, what do you say? It's like burning. So uh, Jeffrey, are you still there? Uh-oh. There we go. Oh, there we go. I had a little I saw, issue. I just I, saw I, your I, message six minutes ago. <laughs> Lost the internet from the storm. Uh, yeah. We have a snowstorm all, so all of a sudden. And uh, weird. It dropped out. And I just want to let you know in case I didn't know. if that, The nice thing about StreamYard is you'll stay on if you, you're you connected. Awesome. So it looks like yeah. I just, uh, I, but I was just looking. I went like, I'm looking at the phone. I saw it's Jeffrey. Lost him. Oh, whoa, Jeffrey, what happened? <laughs> oh, no, they abducted him again. That happens. Can't, so. can't, can't lose the, the pilot of the whole uh, affair here, man. You know, when you're enemy of the state, so, you know, they come get you. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, that's, you know, I'm, uh, I got to say, like, uh, several books are key in my development and growth. And I think it's important to attain a level of the concept of each book, still bringing it to your own design to a degree. This is one of them. This to me was like the greatest book. I used to joke and say like, that would be the book I would have written. You know, I uh, know my book puzzles, rhymes and riddles was inspired from Gary Chafee and inspired from Ralph Humphrey, but I took a different path. It's not about stickings. It was more about the rhythmic overlay. Well, there is some sticking arrangements of uh, playing Odd time, because it's really about some building blocks for odd groupings. So, But it's designed in different ways. One's kind of like, well, I kind of put it this way. It's puzzles. They're like puzzles. You put them together. Uh, rhymes, because you're using the same kind of rhythm in there, but the melodies change, but they all kind of work in different time signatures. And then the riddles, that's playing threes over fives, fives over seven, seven over fives. And those are all designed in four or four. They have a great value if you're looking to attain that sensibility. I think some of those rhythmic overlays can work really well in terms of like getting comfortable hearing that as an ostinato and being able to play on top of it. But again, that's sort of not 
quite the deal with sticking. sticking I have a question. I have a yeah, question. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, we, we get into the discussion of being deliberate. You and I have talked about that. Of course, I've taken lessons from you for years. And that was, yeah. I've always believed that because if you get into the science of myelin sheathing and all that stuff with neuroscience, there is some slow is better, right? Slow is faster and longer. But is there also a, uh, a decision point for you on the amount of time you'll spend or you think a student should spend really on something per session or day? Because there seems to be a diminishing return. Yeah. For me over time. Right. That's a hard, that's a hard one. It it's, is. You know, in terms of, so like, as I would go through and practice, I would list, I would have lists of things I was working on. And if my head wasn't into it, I would still sit down and kind of put the time in, like punch the clock mm. um, just to go through it. Now there's another side of things. Cause when you're working on concepts, you know, you can get so deep and get stuck in one thing. You don't want to get stuck there. So I'll take a certain amount of time to work on certain things. And then at some point, I'm just going to go like, you know what? Let me put it on the shelf for revisitation. At a later Have you ever day. noticed that? Have you ever noticed you, you, you get into this new thing and you kind of spend a day, maybe even a week on it, whatever. And you kind of think you've almost hit a, a, a cap on it for a minute. And then for some reason, you walk away for two, three days, you come back and you feel actually better than when you ended you feel like you almost have a better grasp and there's something no, I about think, that I science. Think there's some, yeah i think yes. the neural transmitters need sort of like yeah. time to sort of accept that information and then right. kind of root themselves and so by staying away from it a little bit i think it allows the circuitry to kind of complete a little bit more or at least fill in maybe there's a few little more spaces that fill into that large conduit yeah, i think i think people should give themselves that break every so often and, and sometimes you just feel like you're almost frustrated and that's a good time to give it a day or two and your body and your mind will catch up oh yeah and yeah. You, you, it's not a waste to, to sometimes step away especially if you hit that that wall on that or move on to something else like you right. say well i say like you know in the ensemble of all that you do it's like a big lazy susan and you're <laughs> spinning it around and point. all of a sudden in front of you is like you know the Peter, peanut butter and raspberry. And you're just going to hang there for a little bit. You might go like, geez, I'm really tired of peanut butter and raspberry sandwiches, man. I got to get to something else. And you spin it around and all of a sudden comes and it's like, ooh, there's the spinach pasta I was waiting for, mm -hmm. you know? So, and it never ends. You know, it's not like, again, like right. I said, you don't just push it away and go like, nah, whatever. If you're looking to sharpen the tool, it needs to be continuously sharpened make sure it's taken care of that there's no rust you know all those things so oh, there's know, something too between you know, walking away and, and and nibbling on another part of the uh the dolly or <laughs> lazy susan uh another part of that but it seems like something within that you will pick up that will help where you left off on the other uh technique issue or approach or right, like right. that somehow exactly. seeps in its own way as well so it's it's really nice to move around on that um, Absolutely. And I would say that, you know, in terms of uh, the overriding idea of practice, well, that's about like, so no matter what the content is, that's taking your butt, sitting it down and sitting and being focused. So let's say you were being focused on one thing and you're starting to really get inside a clarity of focus with that exercise. Hey, take away that exercise, move it to something else that's new and challenging, but retain that sense of organized thought. That's the bigger issue. That's what you're really dealing with. So content can be spun around to different areas. Yeah. But the overriding theme is how vested into the content and developing the concept are you? And how chill is your head? Because if you look at stuff and then you go into squirrel head or hamster wheel head or you're derailing, that means, well, Geez, you're not really in a good headspace of practice yet. Practice is practice. So again, whatever the content is. So the continuous chipping away of sitting down mindfully and working out details of movement, that would be one set of organiz organized thought. And then sitting down and taking that movement and establishing relationships of how it moves around the kit. Well, that could be, you know, you sit with one idea. You could go like, I'm just going to play B stickings from Barry Chafee. Those are paradiddles, paradiddle diddles, paradiddle diddle diddles. All right, you want to get comfortable with that. And once you're comfortable and you've attained like a feeling of, okay, I can speak the language, you move on. And then you've yeah. got to like restructure that new idea and get it to be there. But the head, 
if the head's not primed and ready to go and that you're not able to bring yourself down to, as I say, bring yourself down to zero, you know, no chatter in the head, look at it matter of factly and go, okay, I did that in redundancy with Wilcox and Bob. Because I would find that I would, just like everybody else, would go through a Wilcoxon study in the All-American Drum. Yep. And all of a sudden, I wanted to take off and try to play it real fast. Yeah. And then it would fall apart. <laughs> I get frustrated. And right. I want to move to another one easier right. that I could say, oh, I accomplished something. No. Don't run away. Yeah. Sit slowly. And that brought out some technical issues. But we are. We are. Drummers are. I've noticed over the years. We are a impatient uh, perfection is locked and we, we want to get in there and then we well, want to play fast and that's part of it. And we want to play clean and we're just not really kind to ourselves in a way. We, we do kind of put on this external pressure of artificial time and everything in a sense. And you're right. You need to just, yeah. like you were saying, just you got a million years to sit in there, be kind to yourself. And it... oops, Jeffrey's having an internet issue. All right. Well, that being said, we are reaching the close to the end here. I've been on a little bit more, oh, hour and 20 minutes. Okay. So, geez, I don't know how to, if I vacate, Jeffrey's still going to be on. Maybe, it'll, maybe this will be floating around in the wind, but um, I'll wait a few minutes to see if he gets back in. If he doesn't, I'm going to um, uh, sign off. But I do want to say thanks to everybody that was here on this live stream. This will be posted on my YouTube channel. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. Put a like, all that YouTube jargon that I never say. And um, if you're really interested in upping your game, you can always hit me up. Again, I've been doing this for, well, 1982 is my start date. That's somewhat of my official I taught before that, but I've been teaching 40 years. So if you want to break down the minutia of technique and then put it up against some cool concepts to expand your range of movement and time and feel, give me a hit up. So that being said, I'm going to exit here. I don't know what's going to happen to the live stream. It might be floating in limbo. I apologize about that, but I'm going to leave the studio. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I will text Jeffrey and just see, are you back? You are offline i'm going to all right <laughs> there you are i was just texting you so you got kicked off again i was just signing off to everybody thanking everybody for their hang i guess the the snowstorm in wisconsin is i don't know i i, I want to it, it could be that or some once in a great while connections with stream arts aren't fun or it's a router issue but we're here um apologize for all that <laughs> no worries no worries so everything should be good in terms of the stream uh this was great and the explanation at the end and reinforcement of taking time super helpful also just subscribe looking forward to more thank you d i appreciate that for your uh, uh kind words and for uh sitting with us all my live streams like i said are archived uh jeff and i have done i think this is like number eight or nine something somewhere like in there yeah yep yeah and uh we may not have one before the end of the year as the holidays are going to get a little crunchy for everybody, <laughs> but look for more. I'll try to get more regulated on this. And it's kind of contingent. I like working with Jeffrey because he knows me well. He's got his technological shit together. Watch his podcast or his uh, stream. He does the streaming. What is your days again? Tuesdays? I, I stream with a co-host on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Tuesdays and, uh, and Thursdays. And he does a variety of stuff talking about tech, but he'll get into like, you know, headspace and stuff like that. I'm into He's the gotta... inner tech. I love the approach to how to problem solve, whether it's learning new tech or learning exactly. new music. As a musician, I'm in tune with that. Right. And I, I always love your teaching on that. Thank you, man. Thank you for that. So um, everybody, peace. Always good to hang. Jeffrey, I'll see you down the line. And uh I don't know. Play that outro music. All right, Sarah. Well, thank you to everybody, and we will see you next time. <laughs>